Good evening, everybody. Hope you're all having a fantastic evening. My name is Thomas Sheedy, president and founder of Atheists for Liberty. We have a fantastic show, um, and I've been really looking forward to bring on this guest for quite some time. He's been a very early supporter of our organization since really a little after our inception. And I think we're just going to have an amazing discussion. I already had a lively chat with him just about business. And uh, I know that if we're having a good chat just about like little pleasantries here and there, it's going to be even more entertaining for all of you. I really appreciate all of you continuing to tune in every single week, being subscribers, members, and supporters of Atheists for Liberty. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization that stands for free speech, free thinking, and freedom for all. And this streaming series is continuing to air every single week at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. And we'd like to platform some amazing people and always listen to your suggestions. So we do a lot of great things at Atheists for Liberty, from conference exhibitions to promoting online content and meetups in our Discord server to now doing regional events across the United States. But not only do we like to defend Enlightenment values, we seek to learn from the greatest minds of the 21st century. And this gentleman who I'm going to introduce to you all in a moment is one of those great minds. I am so glad to have him on the program. Our member of the week, we always got to state that here, is Christian Palma. Be like Christian and become a member today at atheistsforliberty.org. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. All donations are tax deductible. It means a lot. You get a lot of great, amazing benefits that are listed at atheistsforliberty.org. So I'm going to introduce our guest, but first I'm going to state his bio. Dr. Gad Sad, professor of marketing at Concordia University in Montreal, has pioneered the use of evolutionary psychology in marketing and consumer behavior. His works include The Consuming Instinct, What Juicy Burgers, Ferraris, Pornography, and Gift Giving Reveal About Human Nature, The Evolutionary Basis of Consumption, and evolutionary psychology in the business scientists, sciences. Dr. Sad has published over 75 scientific papers at the intersection of marketing, advertising, psychology, and medicine and economics. His Psychology Today blog, Homo <laughs> Consumericus, and YouTube channel, The Sad Truth, have garnered 6.4 million and 19.7 million total views, respectively. And that's an old number, guys. In addition to his scientific work, Dr. Sad is a leading public intellectual who often writes and speaks about idea pathogens that are destroying logic, science, reason, and common sense. His recent book is titled The Parasitic Mind, How Infectious Ideas Are Killing Common Sense. Gad Sad, welcome to the channel. How are you doing? So good to be with you, Mr. Sheedy. Doing very good. My God, that's a long bio, but it's a bio <laughs> based on a man of experience. Right. Um, and I'm white so hair, glad to have you. Hair. Thank you. Yes. Um, man, this is this is going to be one awesome show. I've been I've been I've been really looking forward to having you on here, and so much so that there's a ton of AFL members that have been asking for me to get you on here, and already memes have been created about you, just <laughs> flowing within our Discord server, flowing within my friend groups, and um, you've always been a staunch anti-woke atheist ally um, to have. And I really appreciate you uh, supporting us and also being on our advisory board. Thank you so much. It's, it's a pleasure and honor to be on the board. So speaking of a long history, wanted to go into this first topic. You know, you got platformed um, in kind of the anti-woke intellectual space. You were one of the kind of early thinkers to do so. Um, I, I'm a big fan of the Rubin Report. And you got platformed by him back in 2015 before it even became public. You were on like the beta episode and you were like technically <laughs> uh, his first real guest before right. Sam Harris. That's and I right. know that's a whole other topic that we could get into. Um, but you've been largely supported throughout the years by numerous different types. And we're one of the earliest people to speak out against wokeism infiltrating the atheist community. So you've been a big advocate for standing up against these crazy idea pathogens, as explained in your book, that are just corroding and destroying all of Western civilization. But you're also a man of integrity. And sometimes when things aren't most convenient to say in politics, you say things anyways that you believe. In. Um, and so speaking of the Rubin Report, so this was over a year ago, back in October of 2021. I'll go ahead and read this. Back in late 2021, you were with two other Atheist for Liberty advisors, Michael Shermer and Peter Bogosian, discussing how the intellectual dark web, or IDW, fell apart. During that episode, Dave Rubin discussed his belief 
that at the end of a purely secular society on enlightenment values, you're going to end up with wokeism. And if society is only based on logic and reason, you end up being in the most irrational world. Peter Boghossian followed up uh, after Dave said that by rightfully and respectfully pushing back against that argument, saying that societies uh, don't bend the moral arc towards justice, as explained in Michael Shermer's book, tend to be more religious. Dave then mentions how he believed that due to hyper-secularization, America has not been able to further liberalize under Enlightenment values. But rightfully, you, Dr. Boghossian and Dr. Shermer, push back against this anti-secularism talking point explaining that it's because wokeism is religious that we have the pr current problems that we have today. Um, what What's kind of your take on the, I, I don't know if you've noticed this, being, I guess, in the anti-woke space, um, religious talking points that pop up saying that the only way that you can actually stand up against the idea pathogens is if you believe in some kind of creator of the universe, some kind of God, have Judeo-Christian morality or values, and that you can't be an atheist or, or a rational free thinker and stand up against these pathogens. Well, I mean, of course, as you might imagine, I uh, staunchly disagree with that. Uh, I think the the way to inoculate yourself against the idea of pathogens that I discuss in the parasitic mind is through the scientific method. That That's the God to which I pray. Uh, to reason, to logic, to common sense. So there are, uh, I mean, if the only way to 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 be inoculated against idea pathogens is through some religious fervor, then how do we explain my existence? How do we explain the fact that I wrote the parasitic mind? So, so I don't think that you need to be, if anything, uh, as you know, many uh, previous thinkers, you know, Daniel Dennett and Richard Dawkins have viewed the religion memoplex as a form of mind virus, right? Now, the, the difference between uh, the, the, the memetic framework that they used and, and the one that uh, I took up in, in my book is that I actually argue that many of these idea pathogens are, are parasitic in, in, a, in a literal sense. So in the animal kingdom, what you have is many, many examples of this interaction between a host and the neuroparasite that parasitizes it going to its brain altering its neuronal circuitry in order to advance its typically its reproductive interests. So mm -hmm. you can have a cricket that is otherwise very afraid of water, but once it is parasitized by a particular brainworm, it starts jumping into the water in a very cavalier way because the parasite needs for it to be in water in order to complete its reproductive cycle. And so that was my epiphany in terms of using that neuroparasitological uh, framework to explain how we could be so insanely parasitized by these alluring yet truly imbecilic ideas. Now, some of your guests or viewers may may not uh, know which you know what constitutes an idea pathogen. So maybe I'll just mention a few, if, if that's okay. Please. Uh, so uh, postmodernism is is what I call the granddaddy of all idea pathogens. Because postmodernism purports that there are no absolute truths. We are always constrained by subjectivity, by relativity, by our personal biases. So to speak of an absolute truth is, is silly. There is no such thing. Well, the reason why that's a, a, a fundamentally, you know, nihilistic idea pathogen is because, well, the scientific method does suppose that there is a truth that is out there to be discovered. Now, in science, we have provisional truths. What we thought was true 300 years ago may no longer hold true. There's an autocorrective mechanism to science, but we do wake up every day thinking that there is something to be discovered using the, you know, the dispassionate and impartial, you know, epistemology of the scientific method. So what happens when you adhere to a postmodernist philosophy is you get what I call intellectual terrorism. It's precisely that framework that allows you to say there is no such thing as male or female. Your genitalia does not constrain you. If I say that I'm female, I'm female, period. Don't argue against it. So that would be probably the most dangerous attack on truth, the, 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 the idea pathogen of postmodernism. Other examples of idea pathogens, social constructivism is another idea pathogen because it purports that we are all born tabula rasa with empty minds with equal potentiality. And the only thing that makes us different from one another is a sequence of life events that 
led to our unique life experiences. So it's socialization. So why did Lionel Messi become the greatest soccer player of all time? Well, because his mother must have hugged him enough or not <laughs> hugged him enough. Why did Michael Jordan become who he, he, he became? Same argument. Now, there is an element that is very beautiful about that because it, it gives hope to every parent that each of our children is born with the potential to be the next Einstein, the next Messi, or the next Jordan. But it is perfectly rooted, if I may say, in, in pure bullshit, right? But it makes me feel good. So it caters to my emotional system. Uh, cultural relativism is another idea pathogen. Who are we to judge if other cultures want to cut off the clitorises of five-year-old girls? Who, who, who are we to say that it's wrong? It's their culture. Uh, militant feminism is another one because it rejects evolve biological differences. And so for all sorts of reasons, universities have really been the ecosystem from which all of these dreadful ideas have were spawned and then proliferated throughout society. And, and, and the creation of these ideas, the proliferation of these ideas and the defense against of these ideas is not reserved for the religious or non-religious. So to your earlier point, whether I'm religious or not, secular or not, I could be just as easily parasitized. So right. you mentioned Sam Harris earlier. Sam Harris is kind of the poster child of the original atheist. And I would argue that he's currently one of the most parasitized people in the on the face of the earth. So you could be religious and be parasitized, and you could be secular and atheist and be parasitized. Yeah. Yeah, we've seen this happen, you know, especially with uh, speaking of atheism and the original atheists, the so-called community of free thinkers and skeptics and rationalists, the new atheist community, yeah. turned into a pile of rubble the moment uh, people were criticized of being racist for criticizing yeah. Islam, the religion of brown people. <laughs> exactly. And probably the the poster child of, you know, the 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 atheist movement who is completely out of his mind is a guy i don't know if you know him you know pz myers oh i do he loves me he, I, he, you're being sarcastic a fan of, of thomas <laughs> and of well you know i didn't know who the guy was but then people would tag me and say oh check what this guy is saying <laughs> about you his his original animus against me didn't stem from any of my you know uh engagement against islam or religiosity or it really came from the fact that according to him i was I, along with every other evolutionary psychologist, were complete charlatans, were faux scientists. We understood not a single thing about evolution, but he did in that the last paper that he published was probably earlier than when Baruch Spinoza was alive, probably <laughs> around the 19th century. So even though, so he sat on top of his pedestal of grandiosity, comforted by the fact that that he had published as many papers in his career as some of the squirrels that run in my backyard, but yet he could he could look down on all of us as the imbeciles and lobotomized idiots that we were. So that was the first time that I was exposed to the fact that many atheists are not necessarily bright. Oh, I got to send this to you. Uh, you know, I guess when we get off the air or something like that. So PZ Myers, he ended up writing a hit piece on Atheists for Liberty. And at the time, you were already on the board of advisors. So at, this was on his stupid free thought blogs website, you know, the, the, the yeah. home of social justice advocates of true equality. Yes. Um, <laughs> and he ended up writing. I remember there was this one section where he was describing all the advisors. Look at this bunch of racists, yeah. rapists, evolutionary psychologists. <laughs> and just, just mentioning. Evolutionary psychologist, as if it fit, that term just fits together in with all the other categories. <laughs> Which and what's incredible, I mean, for, for some of your viewers who may not know what an evolutionary psychologist is, all that an evolutionary psychologist is is someone who applies the principles of evolution to the study of the most important organ that defines our personhood, which is our brain, our mind. So so P. Z. Myers is perfectly happy to use the exact same evolutionary principles that I might use except that he uses them to study the evolution of the mating behavior of a salamander. Well, that's science. But if I use the exact same principles to explain the mating behavior of humans, well, I'm just a quack pseudo intellectual, uh, you know, Jewish Nazi. So, so I'm just going to quickly showcase this. And usually I have a, a tradition of showcasing all the comments and questions once we're done with the main questions, but we got P uh, PZ. He actually said this, this is the quote. That's a real rogues gallery of racists, rapists, <laughs> evolutionary psychologists, and dishonest scum. So am I? So am I? Am I all of those things, or do I? I, I guess so. I guess okay. we all. Are. Okay. 
Oh, well. Uh, see, we're, we're only 15 minutes in, and this is like one of the funnest streams I've ever been on. Oh, oh my God. So just question one on that. So I'm, I'm very glad uh, that you have that stance. So regardless if you're secular, regardless if you're not, you know, these idea pathogens can unfortunately, you know, screw with the entire mindset. Um, and I think it's why it's very important for Atheists for Liberty and what we do to platform all different kinds of people from professional backgrounds, because we've seen a lot of lunacy within, you know, the atheist community alone. Now there's no atheist community left. Um, so I think I think that was a very good answer. Thank you. Proceeding here on to segment two. So speaking of um, idea pathogens, you are most known right now as being the author of The Parasitic Mind. How infectious ideas are killing common sense. Um, and I wanted to ask you about that. Has your atheism or your non-belief, when you wrote The Parasitic Mind, has your background as an atheist come to mind when, when you know, writing and then later yeah, that's That's a great question. So I, I guess what I would say is, so in chapter one of The Parasitic Mind, I try to provide, you know, the background that eventually led me to needing to write this book. And it and we need to go back many decades ago when I was born in Lebanon. Uh, so we were part of the last uh, remaining Lebanese Jews that were in Lebanon. There, there was not much of a community left, but you know we were well entrenched in Lebanese society. So even though much of my extended family had left Lebanon, my immediate family had stayed, although my siblings had already started leaving Lebanon they're much older than me, so they had already started leaving Lebanon uh, before the Civil War in 1975. Now, why do I mention this? Because uh, I I talk about uh, very briefly in the book where I uh, at one point, you know, we're going to this to the synagogue. We we lived in Beirut in, in an area, you know, where it was kind of the Jewish quarter, uh, close to the Jewish quarter. And uh, whenever we would go to the synagogue, I'm, you know, five, six, seven years old. And, uh, you know, there are different rituals. You stand up, you sit down, you you sort of bow, you do the, all these different, you know, Jewish prayers. And I, whenever I would ask my dad to explain to me, you know, what, why was this, why are we doing this? What, what's this about? You know, I was an inquisitive honey badger back then as well. And the answer that he would give me is kind of like, shut up and do, right? <laughs> And, and that, you know, it, it didn't appeal to my uh, personhood, even as a young boy. And so it so certainly the idea that, you know, there was this intoxicating mechanism by which everybody, you know, prayed the exact same way, stood up at the exact point, sat down at the exact point. And when I asked for a justification for why this is being done, all I got was shut up and do uh, probably is where my you know, the genesis of my sort of original disdain for uh, religion came from. Now, I should mention, though, to, to your viewers and listeners, I do consider myself to be uh, very Jewish. But of course, a lot of people who don't understand what that means will say, but isn't that a contradiction in term? Can, how, how could you be Jewish and atheist? Well, to be to be Jewish is also to be part of a shared history to be Jewish is having to run really fast out of Lebanon so that people don't <laughs> decapitate you. So there are many. So being Jewish is a multifaceted construct. Yes, at its root, it's adherence to a religious narrative. But probably the top 500 Jews that you could think of are in history, probably 95 percent of them were not believers. And yet no, no one would contest that they are Jewish. So I'm very Jewish in my identity and that it's part of you know, who I am, and certainly given my history in Lebanon. Uh, but of course, in terms of the practice of Judaism, uh, I'm, I'm certainly not one. Sure. Yeah, we, uh, one bit of experience that I got when I started getting into organized atheism is when I ran the local group, around half of the people that were in there <laughs> claimed to have a Jewish background, but also didn't believe in God. So, right. um, you know, I, I, a lot of people, especially everybody, once you get into local activism, especially in this kind of field, you, you start to see that a lot of people have that shared uh, experience there, um, but not not an issue at all. We, we don't condone anti-Semitism. <laughs> that has no place here. Yes. At all. Although I'm very, very sad to have heard that uh, the uh, rabid, genocidal Jew hater Ilan Omar, Ilhan Omar, has been kicked off the uh, 
foreign um, you know committee affairs right? committee yeah the exact foreign affairs, exactly because i mean it's not fair there should be representation of genocidal jew haters on that committee and now she's gone so clearly it must be because it's racism that's causing this yes yes absolutely <laughs> uh so when it comes to the parasitic mind it has become pretty much i would argue a bestseller i'm so glad that so many different people from you know realms of atheism of what remains of atheism you know that hasn't been corroded all the way to people in the conservative movement yeah. have been buying your book and i'm so glad that you've been platformed um, i think anybody who really wants to truly understand what is happening to western civilization right now you need to go to amazon or go to any of the links down below in the description here and buy yourself a copy of the parasitic mind or what you could do the following everybody if you become an all-around heretic member or above we're going to be buying a bunch of copies of the parasitic mind signed copies you will get a free copy of the parasitic mind upon request shipped to your doorstep and we're going to wow. make sure so so we're going to buy you know a caseload of them uh, just to make sure that you can all get them if you become a member, guys, and support us at Atheist for Liberty at an all-around heretic level or above. Bit of thank you to a bit of thanks to everybody um, going around and supporting us and our mission. And you guys can also stay up to date with what we're doing by going on Facebook, liking us there at facebook.com slash atheist liberty. All right. So speaking of books, let's get into the third main question, and then we're just going to open it up to the entire chat here. Um Parasitic Mind is not the only book that you have released. Obviously, you've already released a bunch more that I explained or tried to explain when I was reading your bio. Um, but you have a new book coming out, The Sad Truth About Happiness, Eight Secrets to Leading the Good Life. And a promotional tweet, by the way, that you made earlier. This is one thing I wanted to ask. Uh, you mentioned personal anecdotes coupled with ancient wisdoms and modern science in offering a pathway to happiness. What do you mean by that? So, you know, to I, I've discovered through, certainly through writing the consuming, so several of my books were academic books that weren't meant for the larger public, but the consuming instinct, the parasitic mind, and now the sad truth about happiness are trade books meant to be for, you know, anybody, right? And so I found that if you want to really uh, excite people, you know, get them captivated by what you're saying, you really have to have a mix, a, a melange of, uh, you know, we're a storytelling animal, so we learn a lot. We're captivated by by stories, compelling stories. Right. And so if you can weave, interweave, you know, stories coupled with the science and the ancient wisdoms that, you know, we know about the good life, then I think you've hit the right recipe to, to really make a compelling and unique book, right? So there are books that have been written on happiness that are strictly sort of a survey of, of the literature, right? Well, to me, that's not quite as interesting when you're writing a trade book than when you also personalize it. I remember someone, when I was thinking about writing The Parasitic Mind, told me, well, ma make sure to write it in, in the way that you go on Joe Rogan. That's And I, I exactly understood what he meant by that, because when you are going on such a show where you're... Uh, you know, you're being watched by millions and millions of people and you're going to be speaking for a three hour conversation. It can't all be lofty ivory tower professorial stuff. I mean, not right. that there isn't a room for that. I mean, if you read the parasitic mind, there are many sections that are, you know, very academic, you know, in chapter seven, I talk about, you know, nomological networks of cumulative evidence. It's, it's very rigorous stuff, but you know, if I, start off the book by telling you about the harrowing experiences that I went through in Lebanon as a Lebanese Jew and how we escaped execution and how I learned to disdain identity politics, having grown up in Lebanon, to then see it being, being something that is peddled all over the West. Well, telling you that story brings you in, right? So, yeah. and so, so what I try to do in this, uh, in this forthcoming book is to Take personal anecdotes. So, for example, let's say I'm talking about, you know, one, one path to happiness is through, if possible, choosing the right spouse. Because, you know, when you wake up in the morning, the first thing that happens is you see who's sleeping next to you on the bed. When you go to bed at night, it's that person who's with you. If that person is not someone that you like, you're not off to a good start to the day or a good yeah. end of the day, right? Now, of course, there isn't an absolute guaranteed path to how you can make sure to choose the right person. But there are certainly 
you know, a set of prescriptions that can maximize your chances of finding the right person. Well, in explaining all that and in providing the ancient wisdoms on that and the modern science from evolutionary psychology, I contextualize that with personal stories. How did I meet my wife? Why do, why do I have, knock on wood, a very successful marriage? And so that also builds a lot of intimacy and trust with the readers, right? Because they know you. So one of the things that amazes me when, you know, I'm I'm so fortunate, I'm so humbled when, you know, many people come up to me every day in the street and so on. I, I still can't believe it, right? I mean, I just think of myself as some professor who goes, in, but then it's like, it's unbelievable, right? Because so, so when they come up to you, they, I'm sometimes amazed because they really know you because not only they've read stuff in your books that you forgot that you wrote that they know about you, but I also tweet things. Oh, I'm I'm having oral surgery today to re remove a wisdom tooth. Uh, oh, I'm I'm very heartbroken. Our Belgian shepherd passed away. Well, someone will come up to you and you know will say like, "Sorry for your loss." <laughs> Sorry for your loss. Or uh, uh, how how is your jaw feeling? And at first, I'm like. I don't, who are you? I don't know, you know, I don't know you. And then I think, oh, wait a minute. I think I tweeted that. <laughs> so, so I think that, you know, in, 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 in creating a book with, a, you know, a lot of peppered personal stories with those ancient wisdoms from the ancient Greeks, with the modern science on happiness, I think you have the right mix to hopefully create a compelling book. Well, once the book comes out, we'll be sure to also order a boatload of those to get oh, you to sign them you. and then send them back. Um, but already, I'm looking at the comments. We already have people that pre-ordered the book. Oh, that's so good. Thank you. Looking. And I know we're going to take what we do is at AFL. We take like the big episodes and then we clip them into shorter clips. So we'll send you the shorter clips and then et cetera, et cetera. We'll just repeat uh, over and over again. Um, but already... Uh, you're exciting a lot of people, you know, oh, so, so I, I don't know what it is. Maybe you talking about your wife or your romance life or something. Now, have you ever thought of doing a Valentine's Day episode? Maybe that'll be I like should. It. You're right. <laughs> I, I should. Well, yeah, I'll tell you. Can I, may I tell you a quick story before you go sure. to the comments? Uh, so one of the stories that I mentioned in the book is, uh, you know, I uh, certainly during COVID every morning I would get up and my wife and I would go for about an hour and 10 minute walk to a cafe, pick up a coffee. We couldn't go inside the cafe. We had to sit outside and then we'd walk back and we'd often cross this uh, gentleman who's, uh, you know, who's a, someone that we know he's a photographer. And one day he stops us and he, he looks at me and he goes, how do you do it? So I look at him, I say, how do I do what? He goes, how is it that every day I see you walking hand in hand with your wife, you're both smiling and you're, you know, you're caught up in this and so that to me was very touching because the fact that this person whom I don't really know very well was coming up to me and asking, how do you do it? I said, I, I really think that hopefully I can, you know, provide those answers in the book. So that's, that's an example of a personal story that hopefully is compelling. Very nice. And I think I think pretty much half the audience is going to agree here already. It's being it's being continuously spammed. So it means we got a bunch of good questions and comments to get uh, to, right. to go over through. Want to make sure I respect the 60 minutes and we're only 28 minutes in, guys. Excellent. Fantastic. Let's get started here. AFL, AFL, AFL. Thanks, Ryan. Boom. That's Ryan's intellectual comment today. Uh, that's Ryan Tuttle, our New Hampshire state director. He also actually works in a similar field to you. And uh, actually, he's uh, I think he's in grad school right now. In his dissertation, he's going to be mentioning you. Oh, that's, uh, that's great. Cool. So I wanted to give uh, a shout out to Ryan here um, for all the great, uh, amazing work that he does. Uh, Gadfather. Yeah, thanks, Kayla. Um, all righty. See, the meme culture around you is already exploding. I haven't seen half of our people. Do you know where that? Do you, do you know where that name comes from? People think that I came up with it, and it's not me. So, about ten years ago, a rapper approached me. His name is Baba Brinkman. Uh, he he does raps to try to kind of excite kids about science and so on. And so he was doing a a video on uh, evolution, and he wanted to. He said, "Hey, would you be in my rap video?" I said, sure, let's do it. And so I put out on social media, I said, hey, guys, I think I'm going to start a new career as an aspiring rap star, but I need some kind of cool name. Can you come up with a, you know, with a stage name for me? And so people listed all sorts of really cool names, but none of them I thought stuck. So one day I was sitting at my local cafe and I was telling the owner of the cafe that story. So he pauses like this. He goes, oh, that's easy. You're the godfather. <laughs> and I said, yes, I'm the godfather. So so all kudos go to that 
uh, cafe owner. He came up with that name. Is he is he gonna get a is he gonna get a cut of the book sales? Now? I don't think so. <laughs> uh, but it's fantastic. That's a funny story. Uh, we got Jenny. Jenny, thank you so much for tuning in. Jenny is saying, if anyone has an Audible membership, both the Consuming Instinct and the Parasitic Mind are available for free right now. You should listen to both of them. Right. Awesome. Yeah, take advantage of that, guys. Ask Gad about the current situation in Lebanon. The government intends to massively devalue their yeah. currency by around 90%. I heard about I I actually saw that uh, that statement in the context of someone who was being gleeful about Bitcoin that this particular person is a, a you know a champion of Bitcoin coin and she was saying, "Aha, you see all of you Lebanese idiots had you put your money in Bitcoin then you weren't you wouldn't have been suffering in this way." Uh you know, I haven't I haven't kept up to date with all of the machinations that are happening in Lebanon, but I, I hate to say it because it's my homeland. I, I think we are getting to the point where Lebanon might be a failed state. Never mind all of the you know political problems and the religious zealotry and all the other you know foreign intrusions into Lebanon. I just think that you know you you pass a tipping point of corruption whereby the only way you can resolve that is to kind of burn everything down and start fresh. So I think we're probably there in, in Lebanon. Uh, that, and that's one of the reasons why I've never felt comfortable returning to Lebanon. I've been, I've been asked by, you know, very, uh, you know, prominent people who would guarantee my security and so on to go back. And I just never felt that uh, I would be safe in any possible way to go back to Lebanon. So, yeah. Oh, has I, I just put this question up too because people have actually been asking that as well. Has Doctor yeah, Sanders? I have never. Uh, we left. Uh, you know, uh, you, you. I can. I can discuss it here, or you can read it in the Parasitic Mind or in other places. Mm -hmm. I've spoken about it. We left Lebanon under extraordinarily dire circumstances. We never. Uh, well, not we. I never went back, but my parents did go back after we emigrated to Canada. So we came at the end of 1975. Uh, they then kept going back to Lebanon uh, on and off because we still had business interests in Lebanon. In the middle of the civil war, they were going back. And finally, in 1980, and I explained this in, in the Parasitic Mind, in 1980, my parents were kidnapped by a group called Fatah, which is one of the, you know, the PL, PLO offshoots. Uh, and uh, some really bad stuff was done to them. And, you know, one could have easily imagined that they would have been executed. But through, I don't want to say through the graces of God, but through the graces of Darwin, the, the, <laughs> the cosmic justice, uh, uh, I think they were in captivity for eight days. And then through some very powerful networks that we had, uh, they were freed. And so the last members of our family to ever return to Lebanon were my parents in 1980, but I've never gone back. Gotcha. Smart move. <laughs> I'd rather have you here and alive and not in a jail cell or dead. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think I can speak on behalf of the membership on Thank that you. one. Thank you. <laughs> not that you're an evil, racist, rapist, evolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> uh this is the best guest you've had since Devin Trey. So I got to say, this is the one guest that is making me laugh the most out oh. of everybody we've had on here so far. This is episode 19 already. Oh. We've had plenty of other IDW-ish, new atheist type people. Right. And I have not been as as relaxed, but also as engaged simultaneously oh, thank you. As, as, as having you on here right now. That's this is, this is awesome. Thank you. Audiobooks are great. Uh, Alice says if you're driving anywhere or getting transport and you can't read, you can still listen to audiobooks. Definitely true. And and guys, Gad said's books are on there. I um, should mention, by the way, the number one criticism that I've gotten regarding the parasitic mind is that I had I did not narrate it. And uh, even Joe Rogan got on my case saying, Why didn't you narrate it? That was a stupid move, and so on. And the reality is it's not my decision to make. So what happens is a when an audio publisher buys the rights to your book, ultimately any decision such as that one is, is up to for them to make. So uh, I, I offered to uh, to do it, but then they said, well, no, we have an in-house narrator that will be good for it. And so they, they decided to do it. So 
I hope that for the sad truth about happiness, it'll be me who reads it because I really do appreciate that, you know, people get used to your voice. They want to hear your stories and your voice, yeah. but ultimately I can only offer it, but it's for them to make the final decision. Understood. Congrats to him on the weight loss. Definitely a great achievement. Oh, thank you. You're very kind. That was, that yeah. was uh, thank you. Got Jenny again saying, Dr. Sad, this isn't a question, but thank you for staying positive in the fight against wokeness. Too many <laughs> others are all doom and gloom, and that's just not helpful. Oh, that's very sweet. And actually, it's comments like this that served as the impetus for me writing the sad truth about happiness. Because what would happen is a lot of people would either write to me publicly or privately and say things like, how is it that you take on all these very serious topics yet you always seem to be smiling you always seem to have you know good humor you're jovial you can be you can act like a joker you know all of my skits that i do the satirical stuff so you can be very professorial and austere but you could be fun and 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 so i saw that there were a lot of people that were asking about sort of the my happiness and now there is an element to happiness that is inscribed in your genes that so it's about 50 percent of a person's you know level of happiness comes from their gene but the good news is that there's another 50 percent that is not from your genes that is based on your mindsets the, the decisions you make the mindsets that you adopt and so then I, I was getting so many feedback from people that you know what is the secret to you always smiling that i said you know what why don't i take a shot at writing a book book and explaining why i'm consistently happy I imagine you you not only become famous in the anti woke space, but also the self help space. <laughs> well, you know, on the view, just get it, right in the center of them. <laughs> you know, it's funny that you say this because one of the things that I mentioned to my publisher for for this forthcoming book is I said make sure that you place me in in front of media across all of the political you know orientations, right? Because happiness is not something reserved for atheists or the religious or the, the woke or the anti-woke. Everybody wants to be happy. But of course, regrettably, because of all of my anti-woke stuff, I'm much more likely to be invited on Fox than I am to be invited right. on MSNBC, which is a real shame because I think that certainly the next book should appeal to those folks. And by the way, the parasitic yeah. mind should, should be more read by people who watch MSNBC than by people who watch Fox. And yet it's only the Fox people who would ever invite me. And that's what's so awful. In fact, that, that that's one thing I don't like about the conservative movement or even conservative media to a degree is I love the fact that you have an entire half of the United States political arena that is against wokeness. Right. The problem is, is that it now looks completely partisan. You know, when you hear woke, some, some adults that have never been to a college campus will just think it's some Fox News boomer talking point when it's not. Exactly. You know, it's a legitimate freaking problem exactly. <laughs> that we experience every freaking day. Yeah, exactly. Right on. We got Rowling saying, quick question. So it's clear you and Sam Harris have been having somewhat of a feud. That's an understatement. Do you think there's a chance you two will work things out at some point? That's actually a really good question. You know, I'm, I truly mean this when I say that if tomorrow Sam Harris were to email me and say, hey, why don't we get on your show and let's hash it out? Hey, why don't you come on my show? Let's hash it out. Hey, next time you're in Southern California, let's go to the, I would be perfectly happy. In other words, my, I don't have any personal animus towards Sam. So it's not, you know, I despise Sam. As a matter of fact, from the, from the times that I've interacted with him, I, I like Sam. You know, we went to dinner once. He's invited me on his show. We've communicated many times by email. We're not best of friends, but we certainly, I think, would have been simpatico. What happened in my case, as I've explained in you know in other actually, I just posted a clip on uh, on the Sam Harris story on my on my show just a few minutes before coming on this show. What happened with Sam is I really faced a bit of a conundrum, uh, which is actually something that I talk about in in the sad truth about happiness, where I talk about the importance of authenticity in living a good life. And so, for better or worse, I'm someone who is pathologically authentic. In other words, I don't have a modulated mindset whereby I say, should I say this because it will advance my career? Should I not say this? It's not as though I'm, you know, I don't have social skills or social grace, but the most important ideals for me, as I explained in the parasitic mind, are truth and freedom. So if I walk away from an opportunity to defend truth, then it gnaws at me. I feel as though I'm being inauthentic. 
So what happened with Sam is that as Trump got into power and Sam started getting completely crazy about Trump and saying some really, to, as far as I'm concerned, outlandish things, morally outlandish because he was violating what are called deontological principles, absolute principles that you should never violate, presumption of innocence, freedom of speech. You never violate those, right? You don't violate those for political expediency or political tribalism. When I, when I saw him doing that, at first I was conflicted because I also have a code of conduct. Maybe it's the Middle East. Maybe it's just me, whereby I don't want to go hard after someone that I know personally. And so I bit my tongue for about five years. But then, you know, he went really wild, not just the COVID, not just, I mean, you know, it, thank you, Jack Dorsey, for, you know, getting rid of Donald Trump off Twitter. Yes, I believe in freedom of speech, but of course, I don't mean it for Donald Trump. Donald Trump does not deserve freedom of speech. Yes, presumption of innocence is great, but not for Brett Kavanaugh. So if a woman comes along and says, he raped me, maybe, maybe not 36 years ago, who remembers? Well, he does. He can. He should not be afforded the presumption of innocence because it's too dangerous in his case. Sure, journalists should be ethical and truthful. And oh, by the way, I wrote a book. I'm speaking as Sam now. I wrote a book called titled Lying, where I explained that it's wrong to lie. But when it comes to the suppression of the Hunter Biden laptop, that was perfectly fine because had it not been suppressed, then Donald Trump would have come into power and we couldn't have allowed that because Donald Trump is an asteroid that is hurling straight to earth. I mean, his exact words. That started really pissing me off. So then I started saying, well, if I bite my tongue and if I hold my tongue, then am I being authentic? No, because what I'm saying is that whatever fleeting friendship that I have with this guy supersedes the truth and it didn't. So I came hard after him within within the bounds of i think reasonable politeness i mean i was attacking his ideas and then all of his fanboys and you know imbeciles coming after me oh, oh you know it's because you're jealous of sam i mean a 3 year old talks like this i mean what what do you mean jealous of sam you know you know i mean you know i go after bill nye I, i've gone after yuval hariri i mean if if i'm going to be jealous of someone i should be going after jordan peterson i mean he's right. made, i mean <laughs> how famous so, he's gotten you know i mean he's such an idiot so I went and you platformed him. So, say again. And you platformed him. I did opinion. indeed. I did indeed. I I, I exactly right. Uh, yeah. You know, Jordan had had written to me before anybody knew him, saying, "Hey, can I come on your show?" And then I helped. Yeah, absolutely. And, but, and you know, that's why that's why I decided to have you on. Now we're platforming you where you are right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> So, so, so to answer your question or that person's question in a long-winded way, there's, I have no personal animus towards him. If he wanted to chat and hash it out, I'd be happy to, but I know he won't. And I'll tell you why, because he's got this orgiastic hubris about him. He doesn't have epistemic humility. He's not someone who he, he's basically, uh, you know, the, the Malibu version of Anthony Fauci. I'm never wrong. I'm never going to admit I'm wrong. I will go to my deathbed defending my position. I mean, I'm speaking as Sam now. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and, and that to me is a very unattractive trait, right? I mean, you know, right. I, I will apologize to my little children if I think that I've wronged them. And so none of us are too big to apologize. So if you're wrong, apologize and let's get over with. I agree. I think, I think it would be very productive for Sam to do that. Um, it was the Bill Maher, Ben Affleck, Sam Harris incident in 2014 that actually kind of made me um, a little bit of a, uh, you know, go awake a little bit, uh, become awake of the problem that was in the atheist community. I watched that episode live as it was happening. I was 16 years old in 2014. Wow. I watched that episode um, with one of my progressive friends of mine, um, Jacob from high school. And I remember waking up, looking at my Facebook feed and seeing all these local state and national think tank, atheist free thinking leaders from the United States bashing Bill Maher, bashing Sam Harris, calling him racist and Islamophobic for daring to discuss the truth about Islam, yeah. just like we discuss the truth about Christianity all the time in organized atheism. And it made me have this kind of weird feeling in my chest to where like I might not be as progressive as I claim to be. I think I'm more of a actual like classical liberal type. Right. Um, this is this is getting odd. And that, that was that was where I really started to open my eyes and see the problems with the idea of pathogens that, that plagued and, you know, destroyed uh, the left and, and the atheist community. So it's it's really a shame 
um, in my view. And I say, I actually say this with respect to Sam. I look up to him when it came to his past success in the new atheist movement and what he did for Western civilization. There. Oh yeah. I, I think you, I think he should agree to chat with you and I really and, hope one day he does. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'll just, I'll just end it with this. You know, it, the seven deadly sins, which is at the you know at the foundation of moral philosophy, or or or, or at least uh, you know some theologians have have mm -hmm. argued for the seven deadly sins. The number one sin, you may or may not know this, the apex of all sins is pride, because pride and in French actually there's a distinction between the positive connotation of pride and the negative one. The positive connotation in in French is fierté. For example, if you say I am proud of my work. The negative one is called orgueil. That's where you you are you are too prideful, for example, to ever apologize, right? So, yeah. for example, in a, in the context of a loving relationship with your spouse, you you know there's a there's a passage that says you know love is humble, right? You've heard this, I mean, theologically, right? Well, what does it mean to be humble? It means to not be prideful, too big to apologize. So, I think what Sam needs to do, I, I really truly mean that is. I, I know it's very hard when you know you're a public intellectual that that is listened to many pe by many people to say you know I think in retrospect I might have been wrong about this, but my God would he get massive respect from all sorts of people that have now abandoned him if he had the courage to do that. So I don't care yeah. one way or the other. But if I were his brand manager, I would say you know what, show some contrition. Get out there and say, you know what? I think on points A, B, and C, in retrospect, I might have been wrong. He actually went along on a show. I don't know if you saw the show. And I actually, uh, in, in response to that show, which I'll mention in a second, mm -hmm. I did a clip called, uh, if my grandmother had balls, we would have called her my grandfather. I did see, I did see that. <laughs> and what, what, that's an Arabic expression now, which I'll translate in English. What, what that was referring to is that Sam went on a show where he said, you know, had every single thing that I said not been wrong and had reality been in line with what I had said, then I would have been right. So effectively, even though I was wrong on everything on COVID, if you can just close your eyes and replay the tape, I was right in this alternate unity. So the level of intellectual hubris that it takes for you to do that is truly gauche. And again, I hope he comes around. He's a good guy. We probably agree on 95% of things. He's straight a bit. Hopefully he comes back. Most definitely agree. We got 12 more minutes, guys. I'm going to showcase some of the best questions and comments out of this bunch, and then we'll wrap things up. We got Stephen who says, Gad Sad is like my cool grandpa. Grandpa? How about that? <laughs> grandpa, come on, man. I'm 58. It's just the white hair. How about you say cool, sexy uncle? Don't say grandpa. <laughs> What the hell, man? I didn't say it, Steve. No, I know. Whatever the guy is. <laughs> Grandpa on my butt. Oh, my God. Alice saying, scientists became too reliant on government spending, so when atheists become woke, it's easy to see how when you follow the money. Yes. I mean, in, in, a, in a slightly different way, you see this kind of careerist uh, mechanism, not necessarily in an, in an atheist context, but... You know, now you have the proliferation of diversity, inclusion, and equity statements. So when you apply for a scientific grant, you have to at the start of the grant. So never mind if you're curing cancer. Never mind if you are solving a mathematical problem that has, you know, dumbfounded us for hundreds of years. The first most important thing of your grant is how are you going to push the diversity, inclusion, and equity agenda? And here's the conundrum that I faced, again, as someone very authentic. Mm -hmm. I wasn't willing to play the game. So I literally am today as a professor of nearly 30 years who held a chaired professorship, the highest professorship at the university for 10 years. Today, I am without funds because I refuse to apply for funds and pretend that I was going to play. Oh, here is how I'm going to use indigenous knowledge in my evolutionary psychology research. No, I'm not. There is no, there is no indigenous evolutionary psychology. There is no transgender evolutionary psychology. There's just evolutionary psychology. Okay, psychology. You know, uh, so, so you know it. You know, being authentic. I mean, in an existential sense, is is wonderfully rewarding. But in a pragmatic sense, you you incur some real professional costs in being authentic. Well, it's it's why also I, I'm so glad you said that about evolutionary psychology because we're just so diverse at AFL that when PZ 
the social justice advocate of truth and um, the global way uh, went after us, he just had to lump everybody in because it was just too many. You know? Right. <laughs> we got Matthew um, saying, thank you for your willingness to support AFL and be on our board. Definitely would love to see this stream shared if you can uh, uh, so more people hear about us. Thank you again for your support. Thank you so much. Pleasure. All right. Let's see here. Oh, uh, Matthew and I are having a champagne toast to Gad's uh, <laughs> mellifluous voice and his zest for life. I, I do have a very sexy voice. I must admit that. Yeah. Let me tell you a quick story that's quite self-deprecating about my voice. So at one point before I was married, I, uh, I, I was uh, having a phone conversation with this woman that was a prospective mm -hmm. date. We, we had a few conversations uh, before we eventually met. She was this, you know very beautiful supermodel type. Uh, you'll see in a second why that's relevant. And so the first time we met, we sit down for a coffee and she says, uh, so I look at her and she said, am I detecting any disappointment in your face? Are you not happy with, what, with what, what's showing up here? She goes, no, no, I am. But based on your voice, I thought you'd be much taller. <laughs> I said, way to both compliment and destroy a guy. Oh, you so, don't, yeah. So, uh, so there you go. Uh, the, the voice, I apparently based on my voice, I should have been six foot four, and I'm I'm only the height of the average soccer player. So there you go. Well, if we ever meet, I will be sure to shut the hell up and not compliment you, but also <laughs> destroy you. And I'll if you're tall, tall, please walk on your knees. So yes, you I'll be sure to do that. <laughs> we got Max. Hey, Max, hope you're doing well. We got a great question from Max who says that Jordan Peterson often argues in favor of religion on the basis that it is useful or that society needs it to function. Can something be both useful and fictional? What's your feeling on this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it, it, I can answer it one of two ways. Uh, as a purist, I would say if it's false, then it shouldn't be spreading. But as a pragmatist, I would say there are very clear functional arguments for why religion should exist. And as I think probably every one of your AFL supporters knows, uh, you know, Pascal's wager was the original, if you like, game theoretic argument for why you should believe in God, right? You can believe in God or not, and God could exist or not. So it's a two by two matrix. And in every one of those cells, it made more sense for you to believe. So it doesn't matter whether he exists or not. It's beneficial. So why don't you just go ahead and believe? So from that pragmatic utility perspective, then I can understand Jordan's position as to why, you, you know, life has a lot of, you know, cruel vagaries, a lot of uncertainties, a lot of nastiness. And boy, would it make sense for someone to believe that they're, you know, you know, God works in mysterious ways. God took, a, took the four-year-old kid that said that, that died from leukemia because he wants the angels to be closest to him. So there are all sorts of wonderful narratives that I can use that stem from religion that could assuage the other word, the otherwise cruel reality of life. But my purity strain does not allow me to, to fall prey to that. So in a sense, yeah. I, I, I hate the fact that I am how I am because boy, it would be easier to, to be a believer because it certainly can help you through a lot of sticky you know, parts in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of, uh, I guess, um, it, it reminds me of people that have to go through loss very early in life, either the loss of a loved one through death or, or, or a very, uh, a marriage or a relationship ending. That's tragic. It's like learning a reality of life that you kind of just want mass to be in that delusion again. Yeah, exactly. And I should say also that by being a non-believer, it actually, and, and I, I wrote at one point and, and I, I, I quoted in the forthcoming, the sad truth about happiness, because someone was asking me, you know, can, can, can you pursue a meaningful and purposeful life, you know, without God and so on? And I said, of course you can, right? I mean, uh, you know, when I meet a new person that is incredibly interesting, that I think I'm unbelievably simpatico with, that I go to have an amazing coffee with, and we're engaged in this great intellectual conversation, that's spiritual. When I'm sitting on a beach and I see the, the majesty of nature, that's, and I don't need to couch that in some supernatural for me to be able to 
have reverence and awe for every moment of life. To the contrary, the fact that I know that we are here for an infinitesimally small time makes every second so important. There is no do-over. There is no afterlife. You better make sure to be making optimal decisions every moment because you're not getting another crack at it. So, Definitely. I think uh, that's a good way to end the show. I'll do some some uh, you know uh, pre-end announcements here. One more comment that I'll just showcase, Kayla. That is some great advice. The Fangirl Caucus. All right, the, the the loyal women of AFL who are like most active in our Discord server, right? They're all spamming the chat here, just loving oh everything you're goodness. saying. So wait wait till I tell this to my wife. <laughs> tell your wife that. I bet she'll love that. Um, <laughs> so there's a Fangirl Caucus now. I guess I guess that is the case. So the fangirl caucus of atheists already demands Gadfather merch. So we're gonna have to have a very serious board meeting very tomorrow nice. just to get that out once the merch store comes out. But let's do some announcements, everybody, and then we'll end the show for today. So everybody become a member at Atheist for Liberty, guys. We're doing a lot of amazing work, platforming amazing, wonderful people like Dr. Sad here, um, but also doing a lot of on-the-ground activism. We're trying to build community in all 50 states, expanding a state director program that makes American Atheist State Director Program look like playing with Play-Doh, okay? And it could use membership contributions. The, our growth and our success is reliant on all of you just going to atheistforliberty.org, clicking the Join Us button on the homepage, and becoming a member. Starting membership, guys, is 12 bucks for the year, okay? That's less than what it costs for a Netflix subscription. Less than what it costs for, I bet, Disney Plus 2 and all these other different streaming services that we all use today. And you get to support real amazing people that tr are trying to make this country and our civilization a better place. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, guys. We're platforming people every single week, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Every single week, we're platforming a new person. We try our very best to get on a variety of minds. And we try to create short clips so we can spread things all over the Internet and grow community. Also, a few things we're doing in person. We're going to be at CPAC 2023, everybody, sponsoring for our fourth year, March 1st to the 4th in National Harbor, Maryland, trying to make the case to the conservative movement that the atheists are here to stay. And those regional meetups are starting throughout the country. We're beginning that by meeting in New York City this Saturday, February 4th at 7 p.m. at the Metropolitan Republican Club. Go on our social media, guys. Eventbrite tickets are free and includes free food, free drinks, free alcohol, and much, much more. Follow us on Twitter. Follow us on Instagram. And again, tune in next week at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific for our next stream. Dr. Sad, thank you so much for coming on the show. Until yeah. next time, sir. Thank you. It was a delight to speak to you. You're doing great work. Keep it up. Thank you so much. Cheers.